Archies, this was Seyor de Set. To U.S. Army troops, it was an impregnable fortress. Buffalo soldiers once patrolled here, and travelers through the valley called it an island in the sky. Today, we know it as Chiricahua National Monument, an ever-changing area, part desert, part mountain, part natural rock sculptures, protected by the National Park Service for your use and enjoyment. Hidden in a corner of southeastern Arizona, Chiricahua National Monument is home to an astonishing variety of wildlife, like acorn woodpeckers and black caterpillars that feed on manzanita branches. Colonies of Coatamundis live here along with the collared lizard and band rock rattlesnake. On the upper slopes, the Arizona white-tailed deer and bobcats have made homes for themselves. They all survive here because the Chiricahua Monument includes many different habitats. Within its 17 square miles, two great deserts, the Sonoran and the Chihuahuan, meet. And two mountain ranges, the Sierra Madre from the south and the Rockies from the north, overlap. In this changing landscape, plants and animals alike have learned to adapt to their environment and depend on each other to survive. In the desert, a clark spiny lizard pants to cool off during hot summer days, while a horned lizard digs a cool shelter under a prickly pear cactus. Hardy hedgehog cactus can grow almost anywhere in the high desert wherever there's a small patch of soil. In the spring, it bursts into bright red flowers, attracting insects and birds which scatter its tiny seeds far and wide. On the high ridges, Arizona white-tailed deer browse on mountain greenery. The process of adaptation began long ago when the ice age slowly melted leaving much of Arizona covered by large lakes. About 25 million years ago, volcanic cataclysms blasted molten material from steaming fissures. The white-hot ash cooled and fused into thick layers of dark volcanic rock called rhyolite. Mountain ranges formed from this upheaval, and then the forces of erosion went to work. Water from springtime flash floods, as well as winter snow and ice, attacked the vertical and horizontal cracks in the rocks, forcing them apart. Plants growing from rock crevices helped widen the cracks, and blowing winds carried off tiny flakes of rock. Gradually, over the centuries, a wonderland of rocks emerged, with slender columns and rocks balanced precariously on top of each other. Early discoverers gave names to some of the rock formations, like Punch and Judy, Sea Captain, or Camel's Head. What would you call this? Some people think it's a duck on a rock, but many Chiricahua visitors like to make up their own names for these strangely shaped rocks that have been forming for millions of years. Rock sculptures are only one small part of the Chiricahua Mountains, though. Spending a day here is like driving from Mexico to Canada. In a few short hours, you can go from shirt sleeves to sweaters, traveling through five of the seven North American life zones. Differences in moisture, soil, exposure to sun, and elevations are the primary factors defining life zones. In the lower Sonoran zone, the desert country from sea level to 4,000 feet, you'll see the graceful Ocotillo, during most of the year, it looks dry and lifeless, covered with sharp thorns. In the spring, tips of the stems come alive with scarlet flowers, and after heavy rains, green leaves sprout along the branches. A colorful caterpillar heads for the new growth. Stands of this well-adapted desert plant are another sign of the desert. 
the prickly pear cactus grows sharp spines to protect the pads where moisture is stored during rainy periods. An edible desert plant, its pear-shaped fruits are made into jellies and the pads cleared of spines are preserved for later use. Like other cactus plants, the prickly pear blooms in late spring. A time-lapse sequence shows some of the many different colored blossoms this desert native produces. Centipedes also live in desert growth, but are harder to find. Despite their name, they don't have a hundred legs, but they must have at least 15 pairs to qualify as a full-fledged centipede. Agave leaves are good places to look for your daily quota of insects and ants. Seems like the end of the road for this one. Not even a hundred legs would help here, but his antenna should get him back on track. Choya cactus is another desert native and a favorite place for cactus wrens to build their nests. Between desert and mountain lies the upper Sonoran zone where the pinyon pine and alligator juniper thrive. Arizona white oaks and woodpeckers are at home here. Along the streams, you'll find the Arizona sycamore tree. It's easy to identify with its large, exposed patches of white bark. Seeds are packed into small button balls, which remain on the tree till spring winds scatter them. Leaves are large and shaped like those on maple trees. Common flickers, relatives of the woodpeckers, like to nest in sycamore trees. Keeping a watchful eye out of another nest is a Strickland woodpecker, waiting for the head of the household to bring the evening meal. Moving on up the life zones, the transition zone is next, where Chihuahuan pines, Arizona cypress, maple and ash trees are mingled on slopes up to 8,000 feet. And high meadows light up with lupin in the spring. Twisted mahogany red stems of manzanita bushes color the hillsides. In the spring, tiny pink and white flowers cover the branches. And manzanitas, Spanish for little apples, bloom from the flowers. Jellies are made from the fruit, and both fruit and leaves have been used for medicinal purposes. In the Canadian zone, you'll find cool, shady forests of white fir, Douglas fir, quaking aspen, and Mexican white pine. The yellow-eyed junco is at home on the forest floor, finding most of his food here, and sometimes nesting on the ground. The last of the zones, taking us up to nearly 10,000 feet, is the Hudsonian, where Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir trees grow. Nature is not as neat as classifiers would like, though, and many of the zones overlap. The Chiricahuas are filled with micro niches or pockets where plants and animals have adapted in places above or below their normal habitats. The hungry rock squirrel moves between deserts and hillsides, changing its eating and sleeping habits with the weather. Cliff chipmunks make their homes along the rims of rocky canyons and live on the abundant nuts and seeds of the Chiricahuas. Coatamundi, a tropical animal from Mexico and Central America, has also adapted well. These members of the raccoon family are known for their good nature. They sometimes travel in groups of up to 50 and feed on berries, lizards, insects, and bird's eggs. A good example of hot weather adaptation is the desert tortoise, now an endangered species. A hard shell provides protection from predators. Food and moisture come from cactus and other low-lying desert plants. The Tucson banded gecko is another survivor, a nocturnal lizard. Large padded toes help to move quickly over hot desert rocks. The shorthorned lizard, more cold tolerant than desert lizards, helps to keep the insect population down as it ranges throughout the Chiricahuas. Gila monsters are poisonous lizards living mainly under rocks or in burrows during the heat of the day. Poison is stored in modified salivary glands in the lower jaw. They are surprisingly agile when searching for rodents and other lizards. Snakes are an important part of Chiricahua's life.
but you're not likely to see many when you visit here. They generally hibernate during winter months and remain in the shade or underground burrows during the warm summer. Most of the snakes are harmless like the Sonoran king snake, the southwest ring-necked snake, or the gopher snake. And they're all needed to keep the rodent population in balance. While snakes have good vision and can see at night, their eyes are not adjusted for distance. A snake's tongue is probably his most important defense mechanism. Here, a diamondback rattlesnake extends his long forked tongue to test the atmosphere. Snakes smell with their tongues by bringing particles into their mouths and into contact with small sensitive organs there. They hear by picking up vibrations through the ground. The black-tailed rattlesnake is one of the few poisonous snakes in the monument and lives generally at the lower elevations. While the Chiricahua Mountains shelter many kinds of wildlife, birders come from all over the world to see some of the more than 300 species of birds living here. Different environmental pockets mean that a bird such as the western tanager can live in upper woodland forests, while the black-headed grosbeak finds the living easy among desert yucca. The sulfur-bellied flycatcher builds its nest in the sycamores of mountain canyons. And the vermilion flycatcher lives in moist bottomland shrubbery. White-winged doves nest in mesquite trees and help propagate cactus and other desert plants. A white-breasted nuthatch, the acrobat of the bird family, attacks the insects and larvae in oak trees. Birders might also see the dark-eyed junco, living where forest meets meadow, or the Scots oriole among the desert cactus. Campers are most likely to find Clark's nutcracker, the campground robber, perched nearby, waiting to pick up any crumbs you might leave behind. The western wood pewee, another kind of flycatcher, builds a nest in an Arizona sycamore tree and keeps watch over the neighborhood as she hatches the next generation of flycatchers. Several kinds of hummingbirds make their home in the Chiricahuas. The rufous hummingbird spends fall in the mountains and spring in the lowlands, attracted by bright colors in flowers or feeders. Hummingbirds can hover in place or fly backward, forward, up or down, or even sideways. Their wings beat as fast as 80 times a second to keep them aloft, and their flight muscles are proportionately the largest in the animal kingdom. Magnificent hummingbirds are aptly named. The males are brilliantly colored with iridescent throat feathers. Originally from South America, hummingbirds are not related to any other family of birds. Because of their short legs, they are unable to walk or climb, but have developed highly specialized adaptations for flight and feeding. A long tongue inside the needle-shaped bill contains two slender tubes which draw nectar from deep inside the flowers. Insects are big in the Chiricahuas, not in size, but in numbers. Some, like this jumping spider, develop curious colorings and habits to survive here. Tarantula spiders look for their food, ants and other insects, among flowers, but are always alert for their enemy, a large spider wasp called a tarantula hawk. A whiptail or vinegaroon scorpion looks for lunch along yucca stems. A pair of extra long arms helps to find those hidden insects. The long, flexible tail of the hairy scorpion holds a poisonous stinger at the end, an insect that inspires healthy respect among desert dwellers. A praying mantis goes to great lengths to get its prey, in this case a spider. Long, thread-like antenna and powerful forelegs help in the chase. Mantises are considered effective pest destroyers, as one flying insect has found out. Grasshoppers have found a congenial environment in the Chiricahuas. 
Their knees are held higher than their backs, and they use their short horns or antenna to test the atmosphere. Powerful hind legs give them the jump on their enemies. Grasshoppers feed on grasses and shrubbery and are in turn a source of protein for birds and other animals. The painted grasshopper has an unusually long pair of antenna and brightly colored markings. In August and September, hundreds of grasshoppers descend on Chiricahua to feed on wet summer grasses and hatch their eggs. They come in many colors, usually with a pair of claspers at the tip of their abdomen. They don't sing, but make a sound by rubbing a tiny scraper on one wing over the other wing. Usually males do the singing to attract females. With these strong jaws, it's easy to see how low-lying plants can be devoured. Flying insects like it at Chiricahua too. Wasps make these oak galls from a chemical they secrete to protect the larva growing inside. A wasp emerging from its protective gall, ready to begin its short life cycle. Beetles live fairly short lives too, in spite of their hard shells and fierce appearance. The unicorn beetle uses its sharp horn to fight or find food. The red beetle protects itself with club appendages to their antenna. The rhinoceros beetle is heavily armored against its enemies and can also use its sharp horn for defense. Its jaws are tough enough to crush the hardest shells of its prey. Up until a hundred years ago, this was still Indian country. The Chiricahua Apache spent part of every year here. They knew every rock and water hole and had names for the distant mountain peaks. When their great chief Cochise died, legend says that Indian warriors raced their horses back and forth over his grave to remove all traces. It has never been discovered. His profile, carved by wind and water along a rocky mountaintop, remains a monument to the chief who tried to keep peace between his people and Anglo settlers. Apaches hid out in the mountains of southeast Arizona fighting the U.S. cavalry, including a troop of black fighters called Buffalo Soldiers. Finally, Geronimo, the last Apache leader with only 20 warriors left, surrendered in 1886. Their families were transported to Florida and finally, Oklahoma. Following the Indian Wars, cattle ranchers began to establish homesteads in the valleys and mountain meadows. Some mining for gold and silver took place in the hillsides and streams. and the mining towns of Hilltop and Gaileyville were also used as hideouts by robbers and outlaws. But it was the wonderland of rocks, those strangely contorted and balanced formations, that drew national attention to the Chiricahuas and led to its establishment as a part of the national park system in 1924. Ranching and mining were gradually phased out, and today, Chiricahua is a park for all seasons. It's particularly beautiful in the fall when stands of quaking aspen trees shimmer on high mountain slopes. In the winter, clouds heavy with moisture rise over the Chiricahuas, dropping snow on mountains, deserts, and rocks. Hot weather plants, yucca and agave, take on a new look when covered by snow. Even Cochise.
cheese head is softened. In the spring, penstemon blooms, and normally dry washes overflow, carrying muddy water downstream. Fields of poppies brighten the desert springtime. Yucca plants come to life with creamy white blossoms and stalks, sometimes growing as high as 20 feet, a standout among low-lying desert plants. While yucca moths are responsible for pollinating the blossoms, birds like the northern oriole dig inside the blossom for the sweet nectar. In the spring, tiger swallowtail butterflies emerge to feed on woodland plants. Black swallowtails feed on nectar from flowers as well as leaves on trees and plants. Storm clouds build up in summertime and sweet mimosa blooms, attracting a wasp which fights its way along the stem. It seems to have been worth the effort. Wallflowers grow against walls in Europe, but in the foothills of the Chiricahuas, they're free-standing and very popular with the bees and ants. Warm weather brings many desert flowers, like the sago lily growing wild from lichen-covered rocks. Seasons have come and gone, but the Chiricahuas, the land of the standing rocks, are still remembered by the Apaches. In September 1986, 100 years after Geronimo's surrender, his surviving descendant and the current chief of the Apaches, Mildred Cleghorn, returned. It was her first time to see the land of her ancestors. During three days of ceremonies, she joined National Park Service officials, military personnel, and historians from across the country 
in commemorating the Apache surrender. She spoke of the love of her people for the Chiricahuas and the stories of the land she had heard as they were passed down through generations. Today, Chiricahua National Monument looks almost as it did when the Apaches left. One of the surviving homesteads, the faraway ranch, has been restored to give you a glimpse of frontier life in the mountains. While much of the Chiricahuas is a wilderness area, you can still explore the wonderland of rocks, still hike backcountry trails, and add new birds to your list. But wilderness also means that no more roads will be built where Indians and soldiers once fought. The amazing diversity of land, from desert to mountain, and of life, from Cooper's Hawk to Bobcats, will have a chance to play out their life cycles without interference from the rest of us. Wilderness means that life in the Chiricahuas will be monitored, not manipulated. These mountain islands will be free to change and evolve as they have for millions of years.